Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge to the traditional owners of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to their elders of the past, present and emerging. Well, today we are going to be talking about sleep-wrecked kids, helping parents raise happy, healthy kids one sleep at a time. Uh, We're going to be talking about myofunctional therapy, which is a term some of you may not be familiar with, but after this podcast, you will be, and you realise its relevance to each and every one of you. My guest today is Sharon Moore, speech pathologist, oral myologist, and author of Sleep Wreck Kids. Um, I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Sharon Moore. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Sharon, you've written this tremendous book, uh, Sleep Wrecked Kids, and we're going to get into that. But I wondered if you might share with our listener your journey, your professional journey, which brought you to this point and this book. Yeah, it's, it's actually a great question. And I, I think it is that journey that brought me to this point and the reason that I wrote the book. And I was always interested in studying medicine and retain that interest in medicine to this very day. But at the 11th hour, I I simply changed my mind and decided to study speech pathology because I thought, oh, it intersects so well with human behaviour. And I was very fascinated with those concepts of behaviour change and modification and also the linguistics because speech pathology is such a broad profession. Mm. Anyway, so I, I studied this and in my career over the last four decades, I have, my career has definitely intersected all the way with medicine in one form or another. But I think in the beginning, I was very lucky because four decades ago when I studied at Flinders University, At that stage in speech pathology training courses, they still did a lot of lectures from medical specialists like ENT, um, craniofacial surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, Mm. uh, ENTs and orthodontists. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so I was very, very lucky in the beginning to hear from dentists and orthodontists who really believed that the way our muscle systems work in the mouth and the face could affect the way the teeth form or sit and also our bite, our occlusion. Mm. Uh, So that was right there. And subsequently, actually, a lot of the orthodontics was removed from our courses. That's a whole other story. Mm. Um, Well, South Australia, South Australia, you were in South Australia? Correct, yes. Which was the home of a type of orthodontics, called BEG, B-E-double-G, which was all about extraction of teeth to get nice aesthetics, but ignoring the fact that there was a whole human being attached. We're going to go down that path. I get distracted. Keep going. I love what you're talking about here because that is a great intro, isn't it, into speech pathology, being lectured by those people. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think it was lucky because I think right in the very beginning it really sowed the seeds You know, it sowed seeds that many subsequently when I've worked with a lot of students and other early career speech pathologists, they'll say, why didn't anybody tell me this? You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, so I do really consider myself lucky. And um, really the first 10 years of my career, once I graduated, I really did go down the kind of behavioural, emotional pathway of working with patients. I actually worked in child psychiatry for 10 years, mm. actually wow. a bit longer. And, and I consider that as well just a, a gift in a way because I was working every day with psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists and I really had solid grounding in human behaviour and how to talk to people, how to counsel. And I think as a very young speechy, that was something that many people don't get. And uh, I think is a foundation for me uh, today. Mm, you know? I can imagine, yeah. 
Yeah, so then after that, I, I would drifted on into private practice and uh, I was being mentored by one of the um, speech pathologists that had taught me at Flinders. And uh, it just seemed that everything that I was doing from then just crossed over somehow had to do with the anatomy and physiology of the mouth and the face and the throat. You know, so I was working with swallowing and with voice and with pronunciation problems that were uh, caused by the way the tongue moved or its ability to move or a, a problem with the soft palate. And, and I just loved that work and I, I loved diagnosing what was, what was wrong, you know, what, what was underneath all that and how could we manage it. And so in that work, I was pretty much always working with ENTs. Uh, and then as time went on, I seemed to be working a lot with respiratory physicians. Uh, and now I'm on the transdisciplinary team for the Canberra Sleep Clinic. We'll get, mm. we'll get on to that mm, later. Mm. But um, I think all that early work allowed me to really explore and use these concepts of um, Sorry, I was working with dentists and orthodontists. All these referrals would just keep coming in and saying, can you please fix this tongue thrust, mm. swallow? And I think at the time even I was surprised how quickly you could correct, for example, an open bite. Well, you can if you understand the cause of it. Correct. If you and don't it's not understand, that simple. <laughs> no, no. But if you don't understand the cause of it, you could be going through surgery and years and years of orthodontics, only to find that it all relapses. Exactly. exactly. So that that's got. Uh, I'm not going to call it a rabbit hole, but <laughs> maybe it is. No, you know. Le, le, yeah. Okay. That's a whole it, other story. Yeah, but but honestly, I think that also underpinned in the in the last um, ten to twelve years, I really pursued avidly a lot more of continuing education. I really wanted to dig deep into my functional science and really understand what was happening with the teeth and with jaw development and with facial development and where did function fit in with that? What was it? You know, what was that relationship? So I uh, really did a lot of study. And I think I did five basic courses, advanced courses, intensives, internships. Uh, and these were all with people overseas because it wasn't happening in Australia. Mm. So traveled yeah. a lot, learned a lot. But still, I would, you know, I'd come back to my clinic and I'd think, but, but how does all this fit into speech pathology? You know, how do I get this to work with my patients and with my profession and, you know, what is acceptable within my profession that uh, makes sense? And so over these years, I literally developed protocols and a new paradigm. Yes. And... I Sorry, you go ahead. No, no, no. It's it's music to my. I mean, I, I think we've had a similar professional experience in that the more we learn, the more we realise we don't know, and we find that rather empowering. And that's what is exciting and drives us on. And I'm sure you've come up with similarly many professionals who don't take that approach, who really want the certainty of knowing that what they learnt is correct, and what they don't know isn't worth knowing. I think they're the two kind of professional journeys many people are on, but this is music to my ears, Sharon. Uh, you know, keep going. I love it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, look, I'm, I cannot resist making a comment about human behaviour here. Mm. Because I think what we're talking about is two a, a pol very polarised views within our professions, but, but it's everywhere. It's across all the medical specialties, yes. dentistry, orthodontics, allied health. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, if you have been schooled in traditional thinking and ways of practising, that's where you want to stay. And it's actually human uh, behaviour to resist change. Yes. Because change is harder than change. You know, yes. change yes energy and effort and in clinical practices like we run that takes time and money 
Mm. Anyway, we won't go. <laughs> we won't go. No, no, no. It, it is actually, it is actually worth uh, just reflecting on there because. A lot of people will go, well, gee, my speech pathologist has never mentioned this or my dentist has never mentioned this or my doctor's never mentioned this. And, and I often say, well, probably the reason they have is because they, they haven't is because either they don't know it or they don't prioritise it in their own lives and would rather dismiss it as irrelevant. It's actually a more appealing way of approaching in many, in some ways. It's an easier path to follow, one of certainty. There's one wonderful thing about certainty, isn't it? It's so much easier to deal with certainty than uncertainty or change. Correct, yeah. And I, I think that is what drives a lot of people's thinking and, and their behaviour. Um, but, you, you know, this, this professional journey that I seem to be going on with my functional science and building my knowledge and understanding what all of the implications for that are... And it, for my professional, for my profession and, and all the people that I was working with, both professionals and also the public, my patients. And I think one of the defining moments that led to the book and writing Sleep Wreck Kids was about six years ago, I went to a conference in Sydney, actually, mm. Uh, and it was run by the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, the mm -hmm. Australian chapter. It is, it, it is a really fantastic group. Yes. And at that time, they presented a conference called Breathe, Sleep, Grow. And there were nothing short of seminal speakers at this conference. There was no way I wasn't going to that, to that event we had Dr. Christian Gimeno, one of the fathers of sleep medicine. We had Dr. Colin Sullivan, who invented CPAP. We had Dr. Bill Hang, who's, you know, an orthodontist who's stretching those boundaries of orthodontics. We had Dr. Jim Papadopoulos, a pediatric sleep specialist, and the list goes on. I'm really sorry about other people I'm not mentioning. Everyone was amazing. Um, but, you know, and, and I realised at that point that the work that I was doing in the upper airway to fix function, that we were focus, focusing on what was happening during the day. And but by doing that, we were ignoring in kids half of the day because half the time they're asleep. Mm. And in adults, it's a third of the time or it should be. So if it's not, <laughs> you should be asleep for a third of the time. And I started to realise that if if I wasn't addressing kids' sleep problems in one way or another, I was banging my head against the proverbial clinical treatment goals because <laughs> poor sleep, whatever causes it, undermines every single aspect of a child's development, yes. every system in the body and the brain. And I think when that, that, that was like a bomb going off in my head and I thought, but there's a lot we can do about this. Why don't people know about this? Hmm. Why don't well, people know? Yes, well, it's interesting and we are going to dive into the book, but I think it'd be good to lay some foundation here because, you know, you and I could go on and talk about this for hours and we would know exactly what we're talking about um, in, in many ways, but let's start with some basics. Firstly, what is myofunctional therapy? And, and you, you alluded to the fact that uh, the mouth is an important part of how we breathe. And you might it'd be interesting to hear from you why and how big a problem this is. So let's start with what myofunctional therapy is. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'll talk about myofunctional science. Okay. And that is the study of the muscles in the mouth and the face and the throat and how that impacts the functions that have to happen in there every day, the ones we never think about but are super important, like life-saving functions, breathing, eating <laughs> and drinking, and uh, also there's a lot of sensory functions that happen in that system that are critical life-saving functions as well, like coughing if something goes down the wrong way. Uh, and then, you know, we have life-maintaining functions like speaking and voice, which 
are key parts of communication. And so my functional science look at how, looks at how those systems work and not only how they work, but how they also might affect um, craniofacial growth. And in this study, they looking at, for example, how tongue posture affects the way the upper jaw grows and how tongue movement, uh, for example, during a swallow, can impact the way the teeth sit at the front of the mouth. How many on this podcast would understand things like malocclusion? Oh, look, I think we've got a very intelligent community listening to this and uh, malocclusion. Everyone will probably think it's got something to do with the way their teeth fit together and whether, whether it fits together well or in a mal way, a not so well way. So, yeah, go on. Let's make that assumption. Yeah. So, so we'll make an assumption that everybody knows that. So we've got crossovers there with speech pathology. Speech pathologists work on, on what we call communication and alimentation, the way we eat and drink. And so if we look at how the muscle systems are working inside this, I'm going to call it the upper airway because it's really starting at the front of the face and it's coming just below the vocal cords before we enter that lower part of the airway or the lungs. And so a, a speech pathologist's work is looking at what is happening with all of those functions in there and how does that affect the way we eat and how does that affect the way we speak and breathe. And so that would be a speech pathologist focus. But uh, a dental hygienist, for example, that also many of them now are studying my functional science to do this work very specifically within a dental clinic context. And they look at, uh, as we do as well, um, where the muscles rest and how they work and how that impacts where the teeth sit and the occlusion. And so that's probably the simplest way that I can describe it is how am I going? Any other? Oh, going well, because my, I mean, you know, I think we should uh, identify what is ideal because just as we've evolved to have five fingers on each hand and, uh, you know, various, we could work our way through our body parts, but we've got numbers of things. We have evolved to have 32 teeth as well. Um, so I guess we could say an ideal occlusion would be having all 32 of those teeth through and in perfect alignment with just a little bit of overlap to allow freedom of movement. But from a myofunctional perspective, I mean, we swallow hundreds, thousands, what do we do, 1,200 times a day or something like that? You hear different statistics, yeah. somewhere but, between 700 and 2,000 times okay. a day. I so hear different things. That's all right. That's all right. But what is an ideal swallow and where should we be resting our tongue ideally before we delve into some of the problems that can occur? What's, yeah. what's ideal? You I mean, thir 32 teeth through an imperfect alignment, that's an ideal occlusion. Exactly. Talk, talk. Well, you're, you're, what you're doing is talking about the anatomy, which is a key piece of the puzzle because the anatomy determines to a large degree how the muscles can move within the system. And it's definitely what we would call bidirectional because we know when the muscle systems are working properly, they can influence growth mm -hmm. and vice versa. And so anatomy or restrictions in anatomy can restrict the anatomy. But if we're talking about the things that, uh, like a swallow, the ideal swallow is where the tip of the tongue can come up and rest on the alveolar ridge behind the teeth and it presses and stays, the, it anchors at that point and then the rest of the tongue does a wave-like motion to push the food or the drink down into the pharynx. So the and tongue on that palate is a very important part of that process. The tongue on the palate is critical. And what we find is that when there's an atypical swallow, we're not talking about dysphagia here, a, a diagnosable swallowing problem. We're just talking about an atypical swallow. 
is when the tip of the tongue will push against the back of the teeth or completely through the teeth for the mm. swallow. Mm-hmm. So you've got this pressure of the tongue pushing there against the back of the teeth or through the teeth. And um, that's, like you said, if we're swallowing 700 to 2,000 times a day, that's a lot of pressure. But interestingly, in the uh, early research it, by Prophet et al., uh, who said that the, even swallowing, swallowing was important, but the more important thing is where the tongue rests. Mm. Mm-hmm. When, so when we've got nothing else to do, we're not eating and we're not talking, where is that tongue sitting? And the, the, the body of the tongue resting up inside the maxilla or the, you know, the upper jaw is the thing that shapes the upper jaw, particularly in early childhood. Mm. So that position, if I was making a clucking noise, yep. would that be where my tongue should be resting? Or That is, yeah, that's a fantastic, in fact, that's one of the key exercises we do to help kids to learn to use their tongue that way and adults. Mm-hmm. Um, that if you, um, if you did a slow motion cluck like that and feel the suction between the tongue and the roof of the mouth before you release the tongue. See Mm -hmm. if you can hold it there. Okay, hold there. Can you feel all of the tongue, the full body of the tongue, resting right up inside the palate? Yes, I can. Yes, you can. (laughs) Yes, I can. Yeah, exactly. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. That is where the tongue should be resting. Right. Daytime and nighttime. Nighttime. With the mouth closed. With the lips closed with the and lips closed. nose breathing. So there's a, okay. num- you know, we, we've alluded a couple of times to how, um, how functions might influence the way the jaws and the face grow. And we know that breastfeeding is a key function that needs to happen with babies. That is, in, in fact, the sucking motion. Uh, for efficient breastfeeding is the first thing that starts to develop a child's upper jaw. Mm, mm, And the sutures uh, inside the maxilla are really soft and malleable. And that strong sucking motion and the vacuums that are created in a child's mouth during breastfeeding are the things that help to broaden and shape that upper jaw in very, very early development. Uh, So there's chewing, uh, sorry, sucking and breastfeeding, breathing through the nose is super, super important. Uh, The oral rest posture, tongue resting up in the upper jaw and chewing. Mm -hmm. And when we are resting, um, the teeth should be slightly apart, lightly touching, clenching. What, What should we be doing? Slightly apart. Slightly apart. So lips together, tongue resting on the roof of the mouth, Mm-hmm. Breathing through the nose with all 32 teeth through an imperfect alignment. That is ideal. and That is perfect. That is perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Sharon. That's been terrific. No, no, that's not it. Um, what, I'm, what I was going to say was that's not, that's not often achieved, is it? How big is this problem of dysfunctional or malocclusion or dysfunctional resting and breathing positions? How, how, in your clinical oh, experience? I mean, yeah, I mean... Well, in my clinical experience, nearly all my patients have oh. functional disorders of some kind. Yeah. And um, I think the Foundation for Airway Health uh, quotes a statistic of around 85% of adults have some kind of breathing issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, uh, and the, the general statistics, if we just talked about mouth breathing, for example, is around about 50% of the population. And it's almost considered normal you know, to mouth breathe. In fact, a lot of people don't realise that we're meant to breathe through our nose. So, uh, but it, yet it is one of the, the key functions for keeping a healthy airway. Uh, and it's one of the things in a myofunctional uh, context that we that we look really, really closely at. And that actually now then harks back to something you were talking about. You were talking about the anatomy 
the shape and the size of things. And we were talking about an upper jaw that can, and a lower jaw that can accommodate all 32 teeth. And that is absolutely ideal. But it doesn't happen very often these days. Uh, as a, Actually, I don't know the statistic to this. Uh, you probably know this as a dentist that, you know, how many adults have their wisdom teeth out? Oh, well, I mean, I would estimate in my clin just my clinical experience that 95% of people do not have enough room for all 32 of their teeth. I mean, you know, whether they've had their wisdom teeth removed or not, they might be impacted, they're, they're not through. Wisdom teeth are the third molars for those that aren't aware, but it's a very, very common problem. I mean, 90, if we, I often draw the analogy, if we didn't have enough room for all five fingers on our hands and everybody had their fourth finger removed at 18, would we be as blasé about it? I doubt it. Oh, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. And so this actually leads on to that really super interesting discussion about the intersection between anthropology and dentistry. Hmm. Hmm. And there are some... There's a dentist and an orthodontist that I know in the US who are currently doing research at Penn University mm. on ancient skulls. Right. And what they found is that in ancient skulls, adults died with all 32 teeth intact, beautiful broad upper jaws, upper and lower jaw, beautiful broad base to the nose, and they had all their teeth and there was no malocclusion and there was no tooth decay. Hmm. Well, you know, you, you mentioned about the anatomy and having enough room for all 32 of the teeth in the mouth, but we've also got a tongue in there as well, which needs to have room. Hmm. And the problem there, of course, is that if it doesn't, you either walk around with your mouth open and your tongue sticking out, which isn't a great look, or you just walk around with your mouth open and your tongue on the floor of the mouth, or, or you might even walk around with your tongue at the back of your throat, blocking your airway. So they're kind of the three alternatives. We've got a, we've got a tongue to house in this mouth as well. Yeah. So if we, if we segue into, you know, what's, what on earth has this got to, sl to do with sleep? Mm. Well, this is exactly the perfect segue in because, you know, you've written about this and let's talk about it. The airway, I'm just going to come back to the airway again and say mm. that the upper airway starts at the front of the face and finishes, you know, here, just below the larynx. And we know it's a collapsible tube in the pharyngeal section and there's different parts of the pharynx. And so because our faces and our jaws are smaller, our airway is impacted. And so... This is where this intersection anthropology and dentistry is so fascinating because we see, you know, early faces and jaws, there was plenty of room for a nice big airway and now many humans simply have a smaller airway that, that is leading to problems with breathing during sleep. Hmm. And so... Of course, it's never that simple. We really have to look at three things. So if we're talking about just the size of the airway, we're talking about structure. But then we have to understand what is going on inside of the airway. Then we look at the tissues because the tissues line the airway. And so in our modern world of pollution and stress and allergy and goodness knows what, you can have a lot of inflammation and changes in the tissues inside the airway that can also interfere with the way the, the, the efficiency of our airway. And then, of course, we've got function. What are those muscles doing inside the airway? And, of course, that's mainly within the mouth and the face, but also within the pharynx because it's a collapsible tube. And there's been some very uh, fantastic research that came out of Brazil. I think it was 2008. And these studies showed that if we could work with the muscles of the mouth and the face and the throat and improve the patency of those muscles in there, that you can improve 
uh, obstructive sleep apnea in children by nearly about about 60% and about 50% in adults. And you know who was doing this work? Mm. Speech pathologists. Fantastic. Well, yeah, yeah it doesn't come as a surprise to me, but uh, it's, it's great to hear you say that. Yeah, so I think, you, you know, you say, well, why, you know, why did I end up as a speech pathologist going down this pathway? Well, I think there was the bomb went off at this conference at the AACP and, and I'd already been kind of really digging into the myofunctional science. But then, then it took me down, you know, this whole other journey through other worlds of science and medicine and human evolution. So I remember being... Uh, captivated by the sleep medicine science itself and glymphatics. Have you heard about that? Yes, glymphatics. Go on, tell us about glymphatics. Well, glymphatics is the mm. lymph drainage system in the brain that nobody knew was there. Mm. It was literally a new an anatomical system. It wasn't new, but it was discovered uh, only in around 2015. And the only reason they didn't discover it was because it's only visible at nighttime when we're asleep. And so it's a whole lymph drainage system that opens up at night during sleep and there's the, the fluid that flows through there and, and gets rid of all the toxins and it helps regenerate cells and, what, and it has to happen completely every night mm. for you to be ready for the next day. So if you're jipping yourself on sleep hours or your sleep quality is not great, then your glymphatics doesn't have a chance to do what it has to do. There, you will pay the price. Mm. And so I think the glymphatics that set me on fire and then there was all of this anthropology and dentistry and <laughs> how our airways changing and then there was epigenetics. <laughs> That's you know, a whole... <laughs> well, well, the glymphatics, just, just before we move off that, I mean, people will be familiar, may not have heard the word glymphatics before, but they will have heard the word dementia before. And uh, that is a growing problem affecting younger and younger people. And it's often related to waste buildup within the, uh, the brain and damage to cells. And the glymphatic system is about draining that waste. So just let's link those two words, glymphatics and dementia together because they're very important. You know, we've, we've focused on sleep many times in our, on our program here, but I must say I've not specifically focused on sleep for kids, which makes your book just such a wonderful addition to this, um, this very, very important subject. Um, what are some of the, how big is this problem in, in sleep disorders with amongst kids? Well, if we look at the sheer statistics, we know that 40% of four to 10-year-olds have a sleep problem. Wow. Full stop. Wow. Say that again, 40%. 40% of kids in the four to 10-year-old age range have a sleep problem. Wow. Diagnosed. Yeah. That's diagnosed. That they know of. That they know of, because there's been an awful lot of people out there that just my kid's really difficult. I don't know. I'm having, oh, it's just the way she is, he is, you know. Yeah. Been, you know, 40% incredible. Go on. Yeah, look, I, look, it's a big statistic, and you're actually raising a really good point around what does the general public but also professionals understand about sleep and taking sleep seriously. Mm -hmm. They don't because we still have so many myths and misperceptions. And I still, to this day in my clinic, hear things like, oh, yes, Johnny snores loudly. That means he gets really great deep sleep. Yes, yes. Or yes. I can train my kids to need less sleep, you know, mm -hmm. and I can train myself to mm -hmm. need less sleep. And, of course, all these I mean, and there are many more statements, but all of those things mean that um, sleep health is not honoured, it's ignored and it's dismissed. And I think that is one of our first and biggest mm. issues is it's, that's a public health issue. Yeah. And we know that uh, the Sleep Health Foundation in Australia is working proactively around, you know, dispelling a lot of those myths and misperceptions, not specifically for kids, but in general. So it's, you know, public education. And, and they were heavily involved in a, 
uh, sleep health awareness inquiry last year. Have you heard about that? No, no, no. The they uh, tell us about it. Sleep health inquiry. The Sleep Health Foundation and Australasian Sleep Association. Oh yes, I've heard of the foundation, but uh, they did an inquiry on on sleep quality. Well, they they banded the Australasian Sleep Association and Sleep Health Foundation. They banded together and approached the government through an advocacy group to say, hey, you know, sleep health is a big problem. Mm. Uh, in fact, if you've read Matt Walker's, Professor Matt Walker's book. Yes, right, yeah. brilliant. He, he, and now, well, hang on, for our listener, for our listener, we're referring to Why We Sleep by mm-hmm. Professor Matt Walker, who I often quote as saying, sleep is your built-in non-negotiable life support system. Correct. Go on. Okay biological necessity and so and I can't remember if he wrote this in his book or I've heard it on one of his uh, interviews but pretty much two and a half percent of GDP is what it costs to manage the associated costs of the problems that go with sleep so if we fix sleep purely we would halve the health costs and double the money uh, that we have available for education so just simply at that level, you know, sleep problems cost us an awful lot. Um, I got distracted then. Where was I? <laughs> well, well, it, it, it's a it's a huge problem. It's an interesting one, though, Sharon, because we touched on this earlier about how practitioners approach education, and and I'm often surprised, often surprised, when I take a history of a patient who's been on antidepressants for years. And their doctor has never once suggested to them that they have a sleep study done. And my answer to that is either that doctor does not know about sleep or wears their lack of sleep as a badge of honour and thinks, come on, man up. You don't need that much sleep. It's not that important. And so that's why your doctor may not be prioritising it as well. It's about prioritising it. Correct. And you're absolutely right, because the education around sleep health is lacking Mm. across medicine, across all of the health professions. And so when these two organisations approached the government, Mm. the government said, yes, let's do a sleep health inquiry. And there was a lot of work that went into this, which, you know, I won't go into the details, but I think that for those two organisations, it was an absolute coup. Because then there were three, uh, there were hearings around the country, I think four capital cities, and they concluded in Canberra. And I was lucky enough on February the 19th to go with uh, Dr. Stuart Miller to represent the Canberra Sleep Clinic uh, there at that government hearing. This year? Uh, This year? uh, That was in February last last year. And then in April, following the conclusion of all of those hearings, we uh, the government released a document called Bedtime Reading that uh, talks about 11 recommendations that um, the government has to act upon to improve sleep health in Australians. And so once the government releases a document like that, they then are required three months later to start responding And this is, of course, under the banner of the um, public health, the uh, Department of Health. And so we had a change of government. We had the bushfires. We had COVID. So suffice to say, I think the government has, well, not been sidetracked, but very busy with other issues. So these organisations are now ready to step back and start saying to the government, what are we doing? Because there hasn't been a formal response yet and it is required. And so we're now, uh, you know, hoping 2021 is the year when uh, some of the funding that's been requested will will be there to start propelling some of these very critical public health awareness initiatives. And according to Dr Dorothy Bruck, there's not specifically yet something that is targeted in children. But that is where I am the most passionate because I think we can change a child's life trajectory, literally, by improving their sleep. 
And so we, if we look broadly at sleep health, we know that there's um, probably around about 40% of those problems are easily fixable just by tweaking things at home with the environment, with behaviour, with routines. We know that we can improve kids' sleep health so they get the right number of hours and so they get the right quality. But secondly, if, you know, aside from just, you know, those basic sleep health practices, we then need to look at what are the underlying sleep disorders that get in the way. And this is where medicine and dentistry and allied health are so important. So if, you know, if parents have done everything they can to fix the environment and behaviour and routines, you, you can literally do that within two to four weeks. And if there's still something there or, you, you know, that's when you need expert help. So one of the things that I'm very, very passionate about is helping parents take them on a, on a journey to understand what is it that they can do to help their kids and when do I need expert help? And that was really about what the book was about. The book is Sleep Break Kids is about the very big why. You know, why do I need to do something? And now then they need to know, well, well, what exactly can I do? <laughs> you know. Well, what are some of the red flags? What, what are some of the things that parents could or should be looking out for? Okay. So we'll, we'll start with this. What is the good sleep? What is it? <laughs> so mm. I think a very simple formula is according to uh, a kid's age, you need the right quality and the right quantity. The quantity of sleep varies with age. Uh, so you need to understand what that is and you need to create sleep opportunity so that a child can get the right amount of sleep. And that's what doesn't happen a lot. And there's lots of things in modern society getting in the way of that. And then a, a parent needs to see, well, okay, actually my kids are getting 11 or 12 hours a night and they're around the primary, you know, early primary, preschool age. They're getting the right number of hours, but every morning they, they wake up and they're grumpy and they're still tired. Their bed looks like a hurricane hit it in the middle of the night. So, you know, then even though they're getting the right quantity or the number of hours, something is disrupting that sleep. And that's where you would probably need an expert to help you unravel it. And that is also with kids where sleep disordered breathing, airway, the shape and size of everything, the way everything is working in the airway can really impact the quality of sleep. Yeah. Red flags, red flags. Okay. Mo most parents put their kids to sleep and then the kids are asleep. They don't listen to them and they don't watch them, right? Mm -hmm. But there needs to be a little bit of a period of observation to really see, you know, is my child's breathing quiet, as in silent, the sleep of the dead? Is my child's sleep uninterrupted? So if you went in and you heard noisy breathing or snoring, audible breathing, that's a signal that the airway is collapsed or narrow in some way or the breathing is happening a little bit too fast. If you noticed that a child appeared to be holding their breath or stopping breathing, if they would gasp and wake with a startle, if they're waking up for some inexplicable reason and you can't explain why, or well, there's a question mark, what is waking that child? And we need to get to the bottom of that. If you watched your child and they, they were moving a lot, their chest was moving a lot, or it looked like it was hard work to breathe, that's a sign that that breathing isn't quite right at night. Or if they get their body into odd positions. Mm. Very often kids that whose airway isn't really perfect for breathing at night, they'll throw their chin back like this. They extend their chin. And that's their body's way of opening the airway. Mm, yeah. uh, I hear people giggling at photos of a child in 
the snail position. Have you ever seen a, a kid in the snail position asleep? When their bottom is up in the air and, <laughs> yes. They're opening their airway. Wow. Yeah, so there are all these little signs, you know. Uh, if a child is moving a lot during bed, you know, bedtime, sleep time, you say, what is making them move? Because normal sleep is quiet, uninterrupted. They will have brief awakenings, but virtually all of the time they won't be aware of those. And they usually happen between sleep phases and stages, sorry, between sleep phases. Um, we don't need to go into all the no. sleep architecture, do we? So No, no, we don't. But, I mean, the rough, the, the hurricane-looking bed is another example of that. I, yeah. guess, I, I guess whether their mouth is open during sleep, you know, like I did. Mouth breathing. Mouth yep. breathing is a, it's a huge one. And, and I guess the other one that comes to my mind is when you look at your child and they look as this looks, you know, on your book, that looks like a very tired child, doesn't it? Uh, with uh, sort of bags under or blue, uh, Venus pooling, it's called, I think, and uh, looking very bleary. -eyed. So these are just not normal. Sharon, what about bedwetting? People don't often make that connection. What, what function does a speech pathologist doing myofunctional therapy, what role do you have for bedwetting? Well, I think recognising when it's happening is super important as part of that profiling of what is happening at night because really after about three years of age, it shouldn't be happening, but we know when there's interruptions to sleep and fragmentation and, you know, uh, breathing issues that interfere with the phases and stages of sleep and causes waking, it's the same process that interferes with those hormones that stop kids bedwetting at night. Mm. So it, it, it's one of those red flags. Yeah. And it's also when that balance in the lungs goes out of balance and pH and alkalinity, it also affects smooth muscle throughout the body and, and the bladder is smooth muscle. And I, I often have observed with adults as well while they don't wet the bed, they certainly get up at night to go to the bathroom. And sometimes it surprises me and them that they might wake up once, twice, or even three times to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's out of sleep disordered breathing issues often as well, isn't it? Absolutely. It is, it's, it is one of the classic signs, uh, especially in adults, in fact. And, um, well, in adults, you could talk about um, alcohol and how, if, if it's okay if we go down. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, of course um, it is. But, you know, alcohol is one of the things in modest, modern society that disrupts sleep. And it's often thought of as uh, it's great to have a drink because it'll help me go to sleep. Well, it will, but you won't get normal sleep. It will be, whether you're aware of it or not, it will be highly fragmented and you will toss and turn whether you're aware of it or not. You will not get good quality sleep. And um, that then, as I said again, it, it disrupts the hormones that are normally at play that suppress bedwetting, uh, mm. not bedwetting, sorry. That frequent urination. Uh, urination or the urge to urinate at night. Mm. And you mentioned Jim Papadopoulos, actually, who is a respiratory paediatrician, and I remember talking to Jim, and I've got to get him back on the program as well, but I remember him once saying to me that, 50% uh, of kids diagnosed with ADHD have an undiagnosed sleep disordered breathing condition. And yeah. one in 10 kids are being diagnosed with ADHD in Australia. So that's, a, that's pretty yeah. sobering. So apart from prioritising it and arranging the, um, uh, the environment in which our children uh, sleep, and they are two very big, um, big things and routine, what else can our what else can our our, our listener do with a, with a kid that uh, is having sleep problems? Okay, I, I'm just going to track back actually because yep. people would say, "Well, how will I know? I'm not going to stay up all night." Oh yeah, okay, no, no, good, right. good. Um, yeah, thanks. That just doesn't make sense because usually when they're sleep wreck kids, they're sleep wreck parents, and we just don't want that. Um, it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, but things, there are apps that can capture nighttime breathing, things like Snorlab app, 
uh, I think it's free for about four nights. And you would, after a child was asleep, you would put that app next to the bed and then you'll just check it in the morning and see, you know, it gives quite a clear indication on the audibility of breathing and how long breathing is noisy during the night. There are all sorts of measures and activity, actigraphy measures and watches and things. And I, you know, that they're, they're not standardized measures. They're just an indication, but I think can be quite helpful alongside photos and videos. So if you decided that you think that your child's breathing could be better during at night, as in it's not silent, you would take a little video to capture that. You take a little video to show how your child is moving a lot during the night. Uh, you would take a photo of their mouth breathing. And then if you go to your GP or your ENT and say, look, I'm worried about this because little Johnny's getting 12 hours sleep, but his breathing's not right during the night. And this is how I know. Hmm. Can you, you know, can you help me with this? Who is going to help me with this? And then I think you've got to be like a dog with a bone and find the ENT or find the GP who's going to listen to you and help you. And it can be as simple as clearing the nose. Mm -hmm. It can yes. be as simple as changing a diet because what we eat and when we eat and food intolerances absolutely can have an impact on those tissues in the upper airway and breathing at night. And a lot of people don't sort of make that connection. And in fact, one of the most common reasons for sinus and um, middle ear effusion or, you know, fluid in the middle ears and blocked nose is a bit of reflux, undiagnosed reflux, which, you know, the food intolerances, it doesn't even have to be an allergy, can, can lead to that. And I see that all the time. And harking back to Dr. Papadopoulos, he is really good at this. He really looks at the way the digestive system impacts the airway at night. It's a really important connection. And, in fact, uh, Dr. Papadopoulos came up with a fantastic acronym for allied health people like myself. It was uh, the SSS Disturbed Rest system and uh, I asked his permission to go ahead and develop that as a questionnaire for my clinic and he said yes and I've done it and he's approved it and it's a questionnaire that I use with every single patient because after that bomb went off in my head about six years ago I thought how am I going to capture this in the clinic how do I know what's going on at night how am I going to help parents know what to look for so I developed this form and use it to this day alongside a validated sleep questionnaire. And the one that I like to use is the Sleep Disturbances Scale for Children. That was developed in Italy by Dr. Oliviero Bruni and his team. And look, the, the reason I like it is because it digs, it, it digs into a lot of the different things that you're looking for during sleep. And there are other very good, very validated, uh, highly validated questionnaires like the BEARS and um, the PSQ, and they're fantastic, but they're designed to pick up obstructive sleep apnea. But you know what? A child's sleep and breathing problem doesn't stop at sleep apnea. Any noisy breathing at night, including snoring, that's not apnea, is something that we need to address and we need to address it early and we need to work out why. Is it the anatomy? Is it the structure? Is it the tissues? Are they reacting to something? Is it, is it the function? Is it this floppy, sloppy muscles in the mouth, face and the throat that are getting in the way of the airway during sleep at night? And really, it is being like a forensic scientist and working out what are all the pieces of that puzzle. And I love thinking about it that way. It's, it really is a puzzle. And one to solve, and it's not one person that can do it. It really is teamwork between the family, the primary practitioner, 
and all of the other professionals who might be called in to help. You know, it could be ENT, it could be dentist, orthodontist, uh, respiratory physician, paediatrician, gastroenterology, and the, the list absolutely goes on. Um, in fact, uh, one of the... I've recently done a presentation for the International Paediatric Sleep Association, IPSA, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a public health focused symposium with Dr. Judy Owens, who's the Director of Paediatric Sleep at Boston Children's Harvard. And she talks about ignoring sleep at your own peril. And she says that one of the most exciting things for her as a paediatrician working with sleep medicine is the fact that you don't and can't work alone. You have to work with a team. You have to. And she said that's what she loves because when she goes to conferences, it's all these different disciplines that truly have to come together to help kids sleep better and breathe better. Mm. Well, you know, this, this you cover so much of this so beautifully in this book, uh, Sleep Wreck Kids, and I actually, uh, and, and those forms that you've mentioned are in that book, and there are a whole lot of other strategies, and, and I would recommend this book really to everybody, and you could have actually put a, a byline there, I think, Sleep Wreck Kids and the Impact They Have on a Sleep Wrecked Family um, and Relationships, you know, because I think one of the things that people who have children for the first time realise is what sleep deprivation is all about and how it can impact on your mental and physical well-being and on the well-being of your relationships. So getting this right is not just getting the kids' sleep right, it's putting a family on a much more resilient footing I think it's a beautiful book, Sharon. It really is, and we're going to have links to it. Listen, we've covered some great territory here today, and I just wanted to finish up because so taking a step back from your role as a speech pathologist, as a myofunctional therapist, as, as an author now and as a teacher, because we are all on a health journey through our lives, and taking a step back from your professional role, what do you think the biggest challenge is for individuals on that health journey through life in this modern world? Hmm. What is the biggest challenge? I think it's the knowledge. I think, I think understanding, you know, what it means to be healthy and what's in our control and what's not in our control. <laughs> Uh, and understanding those, those key areas of our life as humans that we do have control over, exercise, nutrition, stress management, sleep. We, we actually, many of us do have control over these, and I think to understand that we truly can empower ourselves and our families. You brought such an important point about talking about families and, you know, Sleep deprivation is almost considered a rite of passage in parenting like expected. You must have this. It doesn't have to be that way. You can, it doesn't have to be as bad as it is. And you're right because families are the fabric of community. And so I think finding health professionals, if you can't find the information that you need to put yourself on the right health trajectory yourself, as an adult and your kids and, and your patients in your care, then find the health experts that can help you, that, that think holistically and just start, <laughs> just start somewhere. Yeah. Well, what a great note to finish on because this, is, this book is a great place to start and we'll share the links to that. And I've been looking forward to this conversation since we first met a few months back. Sharon, thank you so much for the book. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ron. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, I met Sharon uh, a few months back uh, and I was introduced to her through another guest on this podcast, Dr. Howard Hinden, who is a 
holistic dentist with uh, 45 or 50 years of experience. And I am so looking forward to the episode that I do with Howie Hinden. Um, every one of us needs a mentor. And if I was looking for a mentor, I could ask for no greater one than Howie. But Sharon was such a joy and a pleasure to meet. And I really wanted to share her with you. So many great things there about collaboration, about an open-mindedness to education, about, you know, you, we've all come into contact with health practitioners who don't think holistically, who are very set in their ways. And in many ways, I understand that because it's a certainty. There's something wonderful about certainty. It makes us sleep better at night, perhaps, because we're so certain that everything that we do is right and everything that we've learnt is right. And anybody that's proposing an alternate view um, is just a nutter. And if I don't know about it, that's not worth knowing. And we know lots of health practitioners like that. But I like to talk to health practitioners like Sharon, who has got such an open mind and after herself being in clinical practice for 35 plus years, is still learning more and more. And as I said, the more I learn, the more I realise I don't know. And I found that I find that incredibly empowering and stimulating and enjoyable. It makes it makes what uh, it makes learning about healthcare enjoyable. And I'm sure that's the case with every other health with every every other profession too. But health is a particularly in, in, interesting one because it affects all of us. And that's why I encourage people to go into the area of healthcare. Very rewarding. Um, and she mentioned about airway, about size, the size and shape of the mouth affect the size and shape of the upper airway, which includes everything above the lungs and below, uh, I guess, the eyes. That's the upper airway. That's the sinuses, the nasal passages, the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, right down to the entrance to the lungs. That is upper airway. And if you've got a narrow jaw and crowded teeth, as in not enough room for all 32 of your teeth, then you have, by definition, a narrower airway. How important is that? Well, fortunately, the human being, we humans are very adaptable and very resilient. So, a lot of people can live a very healthy and happy life with only a smaller number of teeth. Uh, but, but for many people, um, that is an issue which needs to be addressed. And the issue of sleep-wrecked kids, I mean, to anybody that has had children, that has had sleep dep deprivation, you know how important it is and you will have learnt, sometimes to the detriment of, of a long-term relationship, how sleep deprivation brings out the very worst in people and in relationships. So getting this right is a great way of getting family dynamics and relationships right as well, not to mention the health of all of those people involved. It's a fabulous book. We'll have the links to it in the show notes. I hope you've had a good break. I hope you are looking forward to 2021 as much as I am. I think we... <laughs> We needed that break and uh, I hope 2021 brings us a happier and healthier year. I've often said that the um, pandemic has given us an opportunity to reflect on health care, on our health in a global way, hopefully in a holistic way, and to prepare us for this and future pandemics because they're going to come. And the best protection of that is immune function, to not have comorbidities, to not have chronic diseases that are entirely preventable. And sleeping and breathing are two things that are incredibly cheap, but can have an incredible impact on your health and well-being. So um, I hope you found that interesting. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.